First Timothy chapter four, verse seven and eight, it says, train yourself for godliness. For while bodily training is of some value, godliness is of value in every way as it holds promise for the present life and also for the life to come. So physical fitness is good. Of course, you don't have to look at me, but you just know it anyways. Physical fitness is good, but spiritual fitness is better. When we exercise our bodies, we develop physical strength. When we train our spirits, we develop godliness. That is a Christ-like life. Now, Jesus said in Luke chapter 6, verse 40, a disciple is not above his teacher, but everyone when he is fully trained will be like his teacher. Now, the goal of every disciple is to be like his master. So why are so many Christians, of course, they're not here this morning, but why are so many Christians un-Christ-like? in their attitude, in their actions, in their character, and their conduct? Well, the answer is in this verse, because they have not been fully trained. In fact, many of them haven't been trained at all. So the Greek word for train in this verse, Luke 640, means to make complete, to make complete. So that tells me, friend, it's not enough for you to be saved. It's not even enough just to be baptized with the Holy Spirit, speaking in tongues. That's great. That's wonderful. But that's not enough. We must grow and develop spiritually. Are you listening to me? God didn't save you just so you could go to heaven, but also so that you could be his representative in the earth. Amen? You know, in Philippians chapter 1, verse 6, The Bible says this, he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. The good work God began in you is salvation. That's what he's talking about. But God is not finished with you. You know, you didn't just meet him in the altar And then, you know, got a kiss from heaven and went on your way. He's working in you now, developing you, working in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure. And the work that he began in salvation is a process. The new birth is instantaneous. But this spiritual growth is a lifelong pursuit. Can you say amen? Now, Jesus is the Savior But nobody here got saved against their will. Nobody, the Lord did not grab you by the scruff of the neck, knock you in the head and say, I'm taking you to heaven whether you like it or not. No, 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 no. You had to believe. You made a choice to believe and to make Jesus the Lord of your life. Right? Well, Jesus is also the master. He's also the trainer. But he does not develop us apart from our consent and cooperation. In other words, it doesn't happen automatically. The passage of time does not make you spiritually mature. See, some people physically are 40 years old. Spiritually, they're still in kindergarten. should say amen. You look like I'm talking about you. (laughs) Hallelujah. No, it requires a daily dedication. Amen. So what that means is spiritually weak and immature Christians are not godly. See, they're carnal. See, the greatest problem that most of us face is not the devil. It's the flesh. We have looked in the mirror. We have found the enemy, and it is I. Amen. More specifically, your fleshly, carnal nature. Paul said the Christians in Corinth were babies. Huh? 
And he said they were behaving just like unbelievers in 1 Corinthians 1, 3. That means even though they're saved and he never questioned their salvation, the way they were living was not Christ-like, at least not completely. Amen? It's real quiet in this Presbyterian church. Is my microphone working today? You're thinking about it. Hallelujah. Now, friend, salvation is free. It costs you nothing. Free to receive. You don't have to get better. You don't have to improve yourself. In fact, that's, that's just a delay tactic. That's a distraction. It's a free gift that anyone can receive. Amen? We want you to know that. That's what makes you a child of God. But discipleship is not free. In fact, it costs you everything. I said it costs you everything. But it is worth the price. It is worth the price because godliness is profitable in all things. Isn't it interesting in that verse, Paul didn't say salvation is profitable in all things. That's true. I mean, I believe that's true. But that's not what he emphasized in this verse. He said, godliness, being Christ-like, is profitable in all things. Hmm? Praise the Lord. So not only in the life to come, you know, in heaven, but even now, in this present life, in the earth, it pays to live for God. Amen? Are you still here? Now, let's look at another verse in the Old Testament. Psalm 103, verse 2 and 3. Psalm 103, verse 2 and 3. It says, Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits, who forgives all your iniquity, who heals all all your diseases. Now, we've been talking over the past few weeks about the benefits of the Lord, but notice this verse begins with this phrase, bless the Lord. Not just bless the healer or bless the provider, bless the Lord. Unless Jesus is Lord, there are no benefits. I said, unless Jesus is Lord, not just problem fixer, not just the man upstairs, but Lord, then you have no benefits. Hmm? But these benefits, these advantages, these privileges include not only forgiveness for the heart, but also healing, praise God, for the body. One of the benefits of living for God is health and healing. However, to experience these benefits, to walk in them, there's something we need to remember. Do not forget. I don't care what the news media says. I don't care what the newspaper headlines say. I don't care what's, what the, the people in your college are saying. There's something you need to remember. That we have a covenant blessing of healing for our bodies. Isn't that good news? You would think when I would say that, people put a smile on their face. I didn't say something wrong, did I? That's good news. He's your healer. Yes. Hallelujah. Now, uh, E.W. Kenyon was originally a Baptist pastor. Some of you will be happy to know that. He was originally a Baptist pastor. And he was at first skeptical of Christians who claimed to have been healed by God. He was very skeptical of that. And he never preached on healing, never even mentioned the topic. He avoided it. But one day in one of the churches he pastored in the state of New York in America, one day the church uh, treasurer or the church secretary uh, asked Kenyon to pray for this man's wife. She had been ill for a very long time, I think many months, and, and she was bedridden, she's in bed. Kenyon was reluctant to do this, but because the man requested it, he agreed, and so he did his best to pray, and to his amazement, the woman was instantly healed. I think it was the faith of that church secretary, not necessarily Kenyon. And then 
He was asked to pray for a woman in a nearby town who was unable to walk. Well, Kenyon, again, reluctantly, because he's not even sure he believes in healing, he prayed for her and she was healed instantly, began to walk. Soon others began to contact him saying, pray for me. And he's, he's praying for these people. They're getting healed. Well, he's not even sure he believes in healing. So he went to the word of God. That's a, that's a good idea. He went to the word of God. He began to study it for himself. And to his amazement, he found out that healing is part of our redemption in Christ, that Jesus purchased it for us with his own blood, that Christ is our healer, that healing is one of the benefits of knowing the Lord. Hallelujah. And he said then in his life, and these are his words, miracles became a daily occurrence. And during his lifetime, Kenyon, and we have his books in our library, Kenyon pastored several churches and also started several Bible schools, I think more than one Bible school. And his people, his congregation, walked in divine health. They didn't have any sick people among them. And the reason was because in his ministry, Kenyon continually taught on the subject of divine healing, healing by the power of God. Don't misunderstand me. I'm not opposed to doctors and medicine, and I thank God for all of them. But, of course, I'm encouraging you, I'm encouraging you to take hold of the healing that comes from heaven today, you see. Amen? And even if you go to the doctor, don't, don't leave God out of the process. The doctor needs your prayers. Believe God. If you're taking medicine, still you need to believe God. You understand what I'm saying? Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Now, we should not apologize for teaching on healing. I mean, I think some pastors or some ministries, they're, they're almost a little bit embarrassed. Well, I know I talked about healing last Sunday, and gee, uh, please forgive me, but if you don't mind, I'll just mention a little bit. No, 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 I'm not apologizing for anything. We need to have this burning in our hearts, stirring in our souls on the tip of our tongue so that when symptoms of sickness and disease come, boom, the first words out of our mouth are, he's my healer. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Instead of like, do y'all believe in healing and spirit of faith? Um, I, I think so, right? I don't know, do we? I think so. Let me go to the website. No, 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 no. It needs to be burning in you. You know it. Like you know your name. If we ask you your name, you don't have to pause and think about it, I hope, right? That's how it's got to be fresh. It's got to be fresh in you. And that means faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. No, I'm not going to apologize. I'm going to camp right here. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to erect my tent, drive my stakes in the ground. I'm just going to camp right here until everybody's on board. Everybody gets it. Hallelujah. Psalm 105, 37, Psalm 105 and verse 37, New King James Version says this. He brought them out with silver and gold, and there was none feeble among his tribes. Now, Moses led 600,000 men, six lakhs men, not including women and children, out of Egypt. And there was not one of them that was feeble. And the Hebrew word here means to stumble due to weakness or infirmity. Now, all totaled, and we don't know exactly, but all totaled, we know it's, there's 600,000 because the Bible says that, but that's just the men, able-bodied or young men, fighting age men. So easily, there could have been a million or maybe more than two million people that came out of Egypt. And there's not one person among them that was sick. They were all strong and fit because they got to walk. They're not carrying anybody. Everybody's going to walk. They walked. Some of them have trouble walking from Nagarjan to the church. They walked from Egypt all the way to Israel, to the promised land, because none of them were weak. None of them were sick. Bible, the Bible says in Exodus 23, 25, God promised, I will take sickness away from among you. And that's what he did. 
Now, let's look at another verse. 1 Corinthians, here's the New Testament. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 30. That is why many of you are weak and ill, and some have died. In contrast, Paul said that many of the believers in Corinth were weak and sickly. The New International Version says, and many have fallen asleep, just like some of you right now. But actually, what he means is that, that, they, that they died. They died premature. We're all going to die eventually, but they died prematurely. They didn't live out the full length of their time on earth. Huh? Now, I don't know. I don't know how many people, how many Christians were in Corinth. I don't know. But I'm sure of this. It was probably less than two million. Some, some sources that I uh, read said there were only 90,000 people living in all of Corinth in that, at that time. So I know there weren't 2 million Christians in the church at Corinth. So whatever the number was, it was much less significant, probably hundreds, maybe thousands, I'm not sure, but much less than 2 million. Yet Paul said, many of you are sick. Think about that. So we have two congregations. One, numbering in millions, not one person is sick. Here's a much smaller congregation, and many are sick. And these people are all born again. They're thoroughly saved, washed in the blood, and they're all spirit-filled people. We know from reading 1 Corinthians. They're tongue-talking people, and they have gifts of the Spirit working in their church. How do you know? Well, read, read it. Read it. 1 Corinthians chapter 14. He's talking about it all the time. So they've got prophecy and they've got, you know, other things happening, revelation. There's prophets in that church because he said, you know, if something is revealed to another prophet, let the first one be silent. So they got prophets in their church. And yet many, not a few, many of them are sick. Why is that? The clear implication of this verse, 1 Corinthians 11.30, the clear implication is that this is not right. This is not the way it should be. Something is wrong. Something is wrong when Christians are sick. That's not God's plan for us. If, if I have sickness in my body, that gets my attention. I think, wait a minute, something's wrong here. I don't just say, oh, well, <laughs> I guess I got it. <laughs> no, 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 no. That's not the way it should be for us. Amen. So the question is, why were so many of these born again and none of the people that came out of Egypt were born again? None of them had eternal life. None of them were spirit filled and none of them were sick. Yet many here were sick. Why is that? Why? Now, I read verse 30. Let's back up one verse, verse 29. 1 Corinthians eleven twenty nine. 29. For anyone who eats and drinks without discerning the body eats and drinks judgment on himself. First of all, the Corinthians treated holy things casually and even with contempt. Now, specifically in this chapter, He's talking about the Lord's Supper, you see. They treated holy things casually. Real casual, you know. Take it very lightly. And even with contempt. In other words, they had communion, and there's some people getting drunk in the service. I don't mean drunk on the Holy Ghost either. I mean drunk drunk. B.C. drunk, before Christ type drunk. Amen? Now, having a sense of humor... And uh, being fun-loving is fine. In fact, having a sense of humor sometimes helps. And if I didn't have a sense of humor, some of you would never smile all week long. This is it, right? And so it helps for people. A little sugar helps the medicine go down. It's a helpful thing. But, but you see, we should never, never be frivolous with the things of God. See, having a sense of humor, being fun-loving, yeah, let's, that's all fine. But never be frivolous with the things of God. Anything that is holy must be treated carefully. 
right? The Ark of the Covenant, the Old Testament, that's holy, right? Well, one man just, you know, they're carrying it on an, uh, uh, an ox cart, and one man just casually put his hand on it to steady it, and boom, he's gone, <laughs> dead. That was the end of the church service, dismissed. <laughs> kind of blew the parade right there. Oh, it's over. God reigned on our parade, hmm? Right? One time, uh, uh, two of uh, Aaron's sons got drunk. Bishimodu, uh, Kaishe. Uh, <laughs> and they went into the tabernacle and they offered some incense that God didn't command. They bought some potpourri at the body shop or something, and they're, they're just offering this there, and boom, they died. And nobody tried that again. See, they were, they were treating things that were holy like they're casual, common. Huh? Now, see, not many of us here today take communion in a silly way. I've never, I've been here 20, uh, almost, well, 26 years, I guess. I've never seen anybody in this church uh, take communion in a silly way. I've not noticed that. You know, where they're just kind of like, <laughs> just flip the wafer up and something. I've never, I've never seen anything like that in this church. And, and in fact, I've never seen that in any church I've been to. Have you? I've never seen that. I've been, I've been in church all my life. I've never seen that. Right? But maybe there are other things that we don't take seriously. Some people, when it comes to worship, I don't think they're so serious. I mean, we can be joyful and serious at the same time. Some people just kind of like, <laughs> you know, just, 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 it's, just, it's just some fun thing to do. No, 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 that, that's not right. That's not the right attitude. And when it comes to the word of God, some people slip into a coma. Where are they? Yeah, over there. No, I'm sorry. And uh, kind of like roll their eyes, you know, and stop breathing. Oh, here we go again, you know. And, and uh, see, that's not, that's not taking God. You don't have to take me seriously. That's fine. You're not going to hurt my feelings. But you ought to take God's word seriously. It's not, I didn't write the Bible. Don't get angry at me. I didn't write the Bible. They should take the word of God seriously. How, some people don't take the offering seriously. Oh, I could preach another sermon right now, but Pastor Jeppy already stole my thunder. But, you know, uh, when they pass the bucket, kind of, uh, kind of, boom, kind of, you know, like, oh boy, paid my monthly subscription fee. That, that's, not, that's not the right attitude. That's real quiet in here. Let's see if we can get you back up. Hallelujah. Amen. So we shouldn't do that. Now, the Bible says in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 16, Hebrews 12, 16 tells us that Esau was a profane person. Some translations say that, a profane person because he had little regard for the things of God. He sold his birthright for a bowl of soup. Huh? He sold his covenant blessing for a bowl of, it wasn't even meat soup, you know, it was bean soup. That shows you how little he valued the things of God. Would you sell your salvation? Huh? Would you sell your salvation? The devil offered you one lakh, would you take it? Just announce the Lord and here's one lakh. How many of you would take the money and run? Probably nobody. How about five lakhs? No, no. 10 lakhs? How about 10 crores? Maybe some of you are thinking, See, there's a little bit of Esau in you. There's a little bit of Esau in you. Some people, you know, they talk about how they love the Lord. Oh, God, I love you with all my heart, all my soul, all my strength. I climb the highest mountain for you. I swim the deepest river for you. And if it doesn't rain this Sunday, I'll go to church. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> huh? There's a little bit of Esau in, in, in a lot of Christians. A little bit of Esau. But his brother, in contrast, Jacob, Jacob lied and pretended to be someone he was not in order to get the covenant blessing from Isaac. Now, that was wrong. And the Bible does not commend him for deception, for lying. You can't tell a lie and say, well, Jacob did it. It's okay. No, no, the Bible doesn't commend him for that. But at least Jacob regarded the things of God. He had a hunger and respect 
for the blessing of God. He was willing to do whatever it took to get it. Jacob wrestled with an angel all night long. And then as the sun was coming up, this is really interesting, he said to the angel, I'm not going to let go until you bless me. Ooh. Sometimes we have to do a little wrestling. Sometimes we have to do a little wrestling. We don't have to wrestle with God. We don't have to wrestle with fellow church members. But sometimes we got to wrestle with our own fears. Sometimes we got to wrestle with our own distractions, our own ambitions, our own ideas. We got to wrestle with these things. Jacob said, no, 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 no. I'm not turning loose until you bless me. He had a drive. He had a determination. And God liked that. How many Christians we know are so kind of lackadaisical? Well, God, if you want to bless me, you know my address. God, if you want to just, you know, you just, just give me grace or something, okay. It's okay with me. That's the wrong attitude. God does not dole out his blessings casually like handing sweets to little children on the sidewalk. There has to be a hunger and a drive. No, no, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get that healing. I'm going to get that miracle. I'm going to get my blessing. Nothing's going to hold me back. That's what God's looking for. Hallelujah. And God changed his name. He said, he said you're no longer Jacob, which means deceiver. You're Israel. You're a prince who has power with God. That attitude is the difference. That's why it's the nation of Israel and not the nation of Esau. That's what God wants to see in us. Hallelujah. Secondly, the Corinthians, Paul said, they were not discerning the body. 1 Corinthians eleven twenty nine. 29. They were not discerning the body. To discern means to recognize, to see and recognize, uh, to notice, to perceive. By implication, it also means to understand what you're seeing. Many Christians do not realize that Christ's body was broken for us, not only for forgiveness, but also for our healing. Isaiah 55, sorry, 53, verse 5 says, and with his wounds, we are healed. See, there are many fine Christians, wonderful Christians, who love God with all their heart, and they cherish God's word, and they're a great blessing to many, but they don't discern this. They don't see this. They, they, they maybe believe God can heal, but they don't recognize it as a covenant right, part of our redemption. Some of those have become ill. Some even recently have died because they had that blind spot. Doesn't mean they weren't a wonderful person, but it means they missed out on that blessing. Then other people, you know, said, well, see, uh, he was a fine uh, Christian and uh, he died. And so uh, that proves that healing is not for everybody. It doesn't prove anything. It proves that he did not discern the body. Your experience doesn't change the scripture. Neither does anybody else's. Amen. I'm not preaching my experiences. I'm preaching God's word. I believe that as we continue to preach it, believe it, our experiences will line up with the word of God. That's why I'm doing it. Hallelujah. Amen. Also this, we must recognize that all believers are part of the body of Christ. They did not discern the body. That's what he's saying. Well, all of us, not just in this room, but all around the world, all of us who call on the name of the Lord are part of the body of Christ. And so we should endeavor to maintain unity in the body and in the church. I've known of and I've heard of people who motivated by maybe selfish ambition or perhaps they were offended and they, they split congregations or tried to pull people out of church and invariably it affected their health. Let me tell you something. If you damage Christ's body, it will damage your body. Don't go there. I've been in lots of churches where I didn't agree with what was going on, but I just quietly left. And when, you, when I left, I left alone. I didn't take this section with me um, because I respect the body of Christ. Maybe I don't agree with certain things, but that doesn't mean that, that I'm going to go in there and split that thing wide open. You do that and you're going to get in some serious, serious trouble. Don't go there. Well, I need to let everybody know that's wrong. You're not, you're not the head of the church. Jesus is. Your job is just to walk in love and practice the truth. God will work out these other things. Amen. 
Let me give you another scripture verse. Are you still here? Uh, I, need to, I need a little more love here. I'm not feeling the love right now. Are you still here today? Yes. All right. Proverbs 12, 18. There is one who is, whose rash words are like a sword thrust, but the tongue of the wise brings healing. There's one who speaks like the thrust of a sword, <clears throat> but the tongue of the wise brings healing or health. As a young man, back in the 1930s, Brother Hagen had a part-time job uh, working for one particular business. And the owner of that business was 90 years old. But he had all of his hair, all of his hair, no bald spot at all, praise God. And he had all of his teeth, you know, fake teeth, all of his teeth. Some of you are missing teeth already. He had all of his teeth, no arthritis at all. No achy bones, no arthritis, no sickness or disease in his body at all. And so uh, he, he looked like a man who was in his maybe late 60s or something, but he was 90, over 90. So Brother Hagen asked him, what's the secret of your good health? And this man said, well, the Bible says, Jesus said, all of our hairs are numbered. So I asked him to keep my hair. Maybe some of you should have prayed that years ago. I don't know. <laughs> Just a thought. All of my hairs are, of course, some people it's easy to count, but it's, all of my hairs are numbered. <laughs> don't get mad. And, uh, and so I asked him to keep, keep my hair. Then the Bible says in the Psalms that, uh, that uh, he keeps all of his bones. Not one of them is broken. So I asked the Lord to keep my bones. No arthritis, no broken bones. So I asked the Lord to keep my body. And he's kept it all these years. It looked like he was in his maybe 60s. He's 90, 90. And Brother Hagin rejoiced like that. And then as Brother Hagin was about to walk away, the older man said, wait a minute, one more thing. And he stuck out his tongue and said, I asked the Lord, I asked the Lord to keep this. My tongue. My tongue. See, and Brother Hagin said, when he said that to me, I thought about this. I'd known the man for, I guess, some time, and I never heard him speak an unkind word about anybody. The tongue of the wise brings healing and health. In other words, your problem is not in Wuhan, China. It's about a half inch underneath your nose. <laughs> it's closer than you realize. <laughs> It's your words. Think about this. James 1.26. Are you still here today? James 1.26. If anyone at Spirit of Faith Church thinks he's religious and does not bridle his, what's that word? Tongue. But deceives his heart, this person's religion is worthless. That means it doesn't matter how passionate you are. You know, some people, passion, oh, we've got passion for Christ. I'm passionate. We're zealous. We're on fire. Oh, we're just burning, burning with love for Jesus. But if you don't watch your words, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter how many scripture verses you know. Oh, I know it in Greek, Hebrew, Shebrew, homebrew. I know, I know the Bible backwards and forwards. Yeah, but if you don't mind your mouth and get a grip on your lip, it doesn't matter what you know. Now's a good time to say amen. amen. It's okay to say the right thing. Okay, amen. <laughs> so stop talking about sickness. I'm not denying the reality of sickness. I'm denying sickness's right to exist in my body. Stop giving it headlines. Start talking about God's healing power. Stop spending so much time talking about what the devil is doing in the world, and let's start talking about what God is doing in the church. Amen. Hallelujah. Stop vocalizing your fears. It will only enlarge them. Start giving voice to your faith and watch it grow. In Psalm 29, verse 9, the Brenton translation says, and in his temple, everyone speaks of his glory. 
doesn't say, and in his temple, everyone talks about the weather. I don't know. Is it just me? We get through worshiping the Lord, hearing the word of God, and somebody walks up to me and said, how you doing? It's kind of hot this week. I didn't come here to talk about the weather. Is that the only thing you got to talk about, the weather? In his temple, they all talk about politics. You think BJP will win again? <laughs> in, his te- in his temple, they talk about his glory. They talk about his presence. They talk about his power. That's what needs to be on our lips because out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. You're talking about weather because that's all you got in your heart. Nothing. You need to feed on the word of God continually. Amen. Hallelujah. Some people in this temple, they talk about the latest gossip. Hey, why is he sitting there and she's sitting over there? She changed her hairdo. Trina Hankins uh, is the wife of our friend Mark Hankins. She said that uh, when she first married her husband and visited her in-law's home, that uh, she noticed that many times people sitting around the kitchen table talking, you know, chatting, that's fine. And if they started talking about other Christians or gossiping or speaking badly about other ministers, she said her mother-in-law would just get up from the table and they had a piano, I guess, in the next room or something. And she would sit down at the piano and she'd start playing and she'd start singing out loud, let's talk about Jesus The King of kings is he, the Lord of lords supreme throughout eternity. Let's talk about Jesus. And she just sing real loud until everybody shut up. In other words, she said, we're not going to talk about other people in this house. We're going to talk about Jesus. We're not going to gossip. In other words, we're not going to gossip about other people. That's not being weird. That's being godly. That's being Christ-like. Maybe that's why she lived to be 90. Full strength and vigor went home to be with the Lord. Hmm? Amen. Are you still here today? I keep saying that. I guess I'm not getting the answer I'm looking for. Are you still here today? (laughs) Can you take a little bit more? I mean, I'm not going to preach this, you know, this afternoon. This is it right now. One more point. Psalm 103 verse 5 who satisfies you with good so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. Then another translation says, each day that we live, he provides for our needs. Another translation says, he fills my life with good things. Another wonderful benefit of the Lord is this. He's our provider. I won't take as much time on this, but he meets our needs. We read Psalm 105, 37. Let's look at it w- real quickly again. English Standard Version. He brought out Israel with silver and gold. And there was none among his tribes who stumbled. The New International Version says this. He brought them out laden with silver and gold. Not only did the Israelites walk out of Egypt healed, they walked out wealthy. They didn't have like a little bit of change in their pocket, loaded, laden down, like, oh, wouldn't it be nice if you got a bag cake from carrying your money? <laughs> Amen. How? How could a nation of brick makers, how could a nation of slaves emerge from Egypt so rich? Because before they left, God instructed them, ask your Egyptian neighbors for articles of silver and gold jewelry. Before you go, ask the Egyptians for gold and silver. And the Bible says in Exodus 12, 36, that God gave the people favor. God gave them, the Israelites, favor. In fact, the Egyptians were glad. They were glad that they left. Oh, thank God you're leaving that's what we're thinking right now. No. And uh, <laughs> in fact, it says, thus they plundered the Egyptians. Woo. They didn't just have a couple of rupees. They took it all. The God's word translation says they stripped Egypt of its wealth. Woo. He 
He's your provider. He's not El Chipo, the barely get along God. He's El Shaddai, the God who's more than enough. Hallelujah. He, he can bless you in such a way there's not room enough to receive it. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. God can give you favor too. Maybe you've been out of work for a long time, but God can give you favor too. Maybe there's no open doors right now, but God can give you favor. Now, now, does that mean that you all should go home, go back to your colonies and ask your neighbors for money? No, no, God didn't tell you to do that. And you have to also understand this, these people have worked for over a hundred years, maybe as, as much as 144 years without any pay at all. So in essence, God who is just is saying, well, this is their back pay. We built all these pyramids. Okay, now it's time to pay. Hmm? Hallelujah. Glory to God. Now, God directed them but he may lead you another way. Often the problem is this, we're quick to ask God for help, but we're slow to listen to his response. Help me, Lord. Oh, Jesus, help me, Lord. Ah, help me, help me. Oh, time for lunch? Okay, well, come in. Wait a minute. When you present your petition, then be silent and give him a chance to respond. And then when he does speak to your heart, take a step of faith. I'm going to close with this. I see that concerned look on your face. John Griggs, many years ago, came from a poor family. I, I believe they were a farming family. I believe it was uh, in my home state in America. As a young man, he left to go to a larger city looking for work. And after several days, he had no success, no opportunities. And in desperation, he sat down. In despair, he sat down on a, on a park bench, you know, like in the public square. And he just began to weep. He had no money, had not eaten for several days, I think maybe like three days or something. He was hungry. He was discouraged. And he prayed. And he said, Lord... I haven't eaten anything for three days. I don't have anything. I don't have anywhere to go. My family doesn't have anything. Help me. But you know, the Bible says the Lord is near to those who call on him in truth and sincerity. And he said this, he said, he heard like a still small voice speak to him and say, get up, get up on your feet and go down this way. And he did. And he walked maybe a block, you know, not too far. And he just happened to pass a restaurant in the city, an Italian restaurant, you know, Italian food. And as he passed by the window, the chef was putting a signboard in the window that said, help wanted. So he, as soon as the sign was there, he picked it up, walked in with the sign and said, and that's me. And, and the man said, okay. And he, and, and he sat down at the front counter and the, this Italian man leaned over with thick accent and said, said, hey, uh, you, you look uh, hungry. When the last time you ate something? And he said, it's been three days. He said, all right, you, you sit right here. I fixed for you a big bowl of spaghetti, huh? which is Italian food. So he ate that. He worked there and, and God provided for him. And then while he's working, I think he went from that to maybe a better job and a better job. He also went to college and he got his degree and he started his own music school and he became a college professor. And when I was a student, he was my professor. He's just a Baptist man. He didn't know anything about the Baptist of the Holy Spirit. I talked to him, he don't know anything about that. He doesn't know anything about the word like some of you know, like most of you know, but he cried out to God, he listened. And he obeyed. We read the scripture on Wednesday, Isaiah cha um, chapter. Well, we, we didn't read it on Wednesday, but I'll read it to you. In Isaiah 30, verse 21, and your ear shall hear behind you a word saying, this is the way, walk in it. When you turn to the right, when you turn to the left, he will lead you in the way that you should go. He will teach you to profit.